so you recall, we've been talking about quantum mechanics in three dimensions, right? And um, so we've done a couple of three dimensional problems. Right? So one of them is uh, a particle in a rectangular box. So we had a box that's shaped like an ordinary shipping box, like this. And we had a potential energy that's easily expressed in Cartesian coordinates as a potential is zero uh, inside the box and infinity outside the box. Right, and um, then uh, just to remind you, right, what we found was um, uh, a, a wave function, right? Or equivalently, we found the um, energy eigenstates, which are characterized by three numbers, right? n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z. And that is uh, you know, a coefficient times uh, a sine of n sub x pi x over a sine n sub y pi y over b, and the sine of n sub z pi z over c, where a, b, and c are the box sizes in, in the x, y, and z directions. Um, and each of these things corresponds to an energy, right? So each state has an energy E sub nx, ny, nz, and that's the h bar squared, pi squared, and x squared over two and a squared, right? And then the same for y. and b squared plus h bar squared pi squared and z squared over 2m c squared. Um, and so, you know, one thing that you can notice from this is that there are three quantum numbers to characterize the states. Um, that is the nx, ny, and nz. Um, and so, you know, just like we have one number in one dimension, here there are three numbers in three dimensions. So well, that makes sense. And these things are all um, integers uh, greater than or equal to one. Um, and, you know, then we could say, well, a general wave function would be a psi general of x, y, and z is a sum over all these numbers, nx and over ny and over nz of a coefficient c sub nx, ny, and z times the state psi nx, ny, and z. Uh, evaluated at x, y, and z. Um, okay, so uh, this is the general solution and these coefficients c depend on the initial conditions as in all the problems that we've done. Okay, and then it's basically the same story for a particle in a sphere. All right, for a particle in a sphere, it looks like this, right? And we have a potential energy function, V of R, which is uh, zero uh, inside the sphere and infinity outside. And um, once again, we found um, the energy eigenstates and the corresponding eigenvalues. So for the energy eigenstates, 
that is the solutions of the time independent Schrodinger equation. That's the psi nlm expressed in spherical coordinates. So it's some normalization constant times this spherical Bessel function, ANL of R, right, uh, times a spherical harmonic in terms of angle. Um, and um, this thing goes with an energy, right? That this state has an energy E sub NLM, which is the uh, H bar squared times the K NL squared over to M. Um, and the K is this ex complicated expression in terms of where a Bessel function equals zero. But the main thing to notice here is that there are, again, three quantum numbers uh, going along with the three dimensions. And so here they are N, L, and M. And the general solution of Schrodinger's equation, uh, whoops, would be this psi general expressed in spherical coordinates. It's a sum over all of these quantum numbers of a coefficient C and LM times psi and LM of R theta and phi. Okay, so this kind of approach, right? This is a schematic approach right, to solving a quantum mechanics problem in three dimensions that goes along with any particular potential energy, right? And so uh, here we've done it for the two potential energies of a particle in a box and a particle in a sphere. So with that as preparation, um, let's actually go on to the hydrogen atom, which is you know, what a lot of people care about going into uh, quantum mechanics. And you know, this was part of the main motivation for developing quantum mechanics 100 years ago. Um, so the idea with the hydrogen atom is that uh, we have an electron and a proton. All right, so here, let's label them. Here's the proton. Here's the electron with opposite electrical charges. And um, the first thing to emphasize about these guys is that the, the electrical charges are equal and opposite, but the masses are hugely different. Right? For the proton, the mass is about 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And for an electron, it is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So, you know, these are both small masses compared to everyday life, but the mass of the proton is uh, approximately uh, 2,000 times the uh, mass of the electron. So the proton is... Uh, hugely more massive than the, than the electron. Um, and so because of that, right, if we want to solve Schrodinger's equation for the electron, it's a very good approximation to say that the proton just sits there and the electron moves in the potential, right? So we'll just say the, the proton just sits, oops, just sits at the position r equals zero, right? Just at the origin. Um, and then the electron 
uh, moves in the Coulomb potential. And you know, that's like in classical mechanics, we say, because the sun is um, vastly greater mass than the earth, that um, to a good approximation, the sun just sits at the origin and the earth moves around the sun in the gravitational potential that comes from the sun. Right. So now you can remember your E and M and say the Coulomb potential is uh, negative E squared over four pi epsilon naught R. Okay, so where R is the distance between the proton and the electron. And this is a negative, so it's an attractive potential, right? But the plot of it, uh, the V of R as a function of R uh, looks like this, right? So the electron moving around is attracted in towards the proton. So um, this is the potential energy that we want to put into Schrodinger's equation and, and solve it. Um, now, the first thing that you can notice about this is that it depends on the coordinate r, but it doesn't depend on the orientation angles, theta and phi. Right? So it's a spherically symmetric potential. So, um, we can um, use spherical coordinates, right? That uh, spherical coordinates are the natural coordinate system for solving a problem like this. So um, we can, you know, repeat the same sort of calculation that we did when we were setting up quantum mechanics in spherical coordinates. And in particular, you remember when we have the time independent Schrodinger equation, and then we do separation of variables. And we could see that the time independent Schrodinger equation separates into two equations. There's an angular equation and the radial equation. So the angular equation is in the variables theta and phi, the radial equation is in the variable r. And the nice thing about doing this separation is that the angular equation doesn't depend on the potential energy. So we only had to solve it once. We did solve it, right? We know the solutions are spherical harmonics. So that's done. We don't have to do it again. Uh, okay, the solutions are the spherical harmonics, the YLM of theta and phi. That's done. Okay, all we need to do now is solve the radial equation with the correct potential energy. So we're going to work on this, the radial equation that goes with the Coulomb potential energy. OK, so you remember that we worked out the radial equation in terms of this variable um, u of r. That is a uh, little r times the capital R of r. Okay. And what we got was minus h bar squared 
over 2m times this second derivative of u with respect to r plus, um, well, so the potential energy goes here, uh, let's say, plus the potential energy V of R plus H bar squared L L plus one over R squared times U is equal to E times U. This is U of R. Okay, so now let's do this equation and we want to put in the potential energy that we need. Okay, so here, I'm going to lasso it and copy it. Lasso this. All right. So now, in place of this potential energy, I'm going to write in the Coulomb potential which is negative e squared uh, over four pi epsilon naught r. Um, okay, so let's see. In this equation, what can I point out to you? Oh, one is, one thing of course is that this m, this is the m, which is the mass of the electron. It is not the quantum number m. Here, in the book, they say m sub e for mass of electron. Maybe that'll distinguish that. Um, okay, and so this then is the actual Coulomb potential. And this is what I called the um, centrifugal term. So these two things together make a sort of effective potential. It depends on the R. R. Um, all right, so here's a differential equation to be solved. Okay, um, the, the good news is um, this thing is exactly solvable. Uh, amazingly enough, um, it is exactly solvable. The, the bad news is it's kind of a long and tedious solution. Um, I, I don't really want to go over the solution in detail. Um, I will say, go and read the solution in the textbook. And I'm going to describe the solution for you. Okay. Um, so let me tell you things about the solution. The first thing that I want to point out is that there's an effective, um, a characteristic length scale for the solution. Okay. And so um, you can tell a characteristic length scale by saying that there are terms in the differential equation which have different dependences on R. So if you look at the Coulomb term, it looks like um, one over R, right? But if you look at this term, it looks like one over R squared. And here there's a second derivative. So also like one over R squared, right? So that means that there's a characteristic length scale for how the solution depends on distance that comes from the ratio of this coefficient and this coefficient. Right? So if, if we take the ratio of those things, 
we get a length scale which is called the, the Bohr radius. Okay, and it's conventionally written by the lowercase letter a. Uh, and it's uh, defined as uh, four pi epsilon naught h bar squared uh, divided by the mass of the electron and the electron charge squared. And so this is, um, you could say it's the, the, the length scale, um, whoops, I'm, 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 I'm seeing a mistake here somewhere. Oh, I forgot the 2m here. Ah, that's what I did. Okay, um, it's, it's the characteristic length scale that you would get by dividing either of these terms divided by the coefficient in the Coulomb potential. Right? And so either way, um, you know, this, this kind of a coefficient has to have units of energy times length squared because when you divide it by length squared, you get an energy, right? It has to match the energy over here. This thing has units of energy times length because when you uh, divide it by length, you get an energy to match this. So if you take the ratio of this coefficient divided by this coefficient, you should get a length, right? And so um, it, that's, that's what um, Bohr has done here, okay? So it's the, the h bar squared over mass, that coefficient, divided by the charge squared over four pi epsilon naught, that coefficient, okay? And that has units of length. And if you plug in the numbers, you know, it's a specific number. Okay, so it is um, 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? Or for people who like to work in angstroms, that's uh, a half of an angstrom unit. Or for people who like to work in nanometers, this is 0 0.05 nanometers, okay? So this is a characteristic length scale um, associated with that differential equation. And so it shows on what length scale does the wave function vary. And that implies you know, on what length scale does the uh, electron probability change, right? What's the length scale where you go from a high probability close to the proton to a low probability farther away from the proton? So that's kind of what you would mean by saying, what's the size of a hydrogen atom, right? That the length scale here is the size of a hydrogen atom because it's the distance between when you say, oh, the electron's probably here versus, oh no, there's hardly any chance that the electron's over there. So if you define this length scale, then, there's a solution. And the solution is um, U of R is uh, first an R over A to the L plus one power times an exponential of negative R over A times some extra function, which gets a name, of course, and it is called the associated Laguerre polynomial. So this is um, another one of these special functions that's named after somebody. And, you know, we've had a bunch of these things. And as I told you before, 
Um, these are not um, super high priorities for your learning, okay? But, you know, they're things that you can look at. Um, and, you know, it is a polynomial and it, um, it depends on the quantum number n. And it's a polynomial, so it has some degree. Right? And the degree of the polynomial is n minus l minus 1. OK, so if you um, look at all of this stuff, then you can see that um, when the electron is really close to the proton, that is at small l, then um, the first factor goes to zero. And we get something which scales as r over a to the l plus one power for small r. And when we are far from the proton, then the dependence is dominated by this exponential factor. And here we can say the wave function uh, decays as e to the minus r over a for large r. So you know, we get some dependence on r, which is going up for small r. It's coming down exponentially for large r. In between, oh, maybe it connects like this, or maybe it goes up and down a few times, something like that. But there's a, a characteristic region of r where you have most of the wave function, most of the probability. And that region is given by the Bohr radius. All right? So when R is something comparable to the Bohr radius, not necessarily one times the Bohr radius, maybe it's five times the Bohr radius, but it's not a million times the Bohr radius. It's a few times the Bohr radius. And that's where the electron probably is. That's where most of the probability is concentrated. Okay, so now this is the radial dependence. Now we can put together all the pieces. Okay. So then if we put together all the different factors, we can get the full wave function. Okay. And that is a psi uh, which has three quantum numbers in it, n, l, and m, um, like the particle in a sphere. Like any three-dimensional problem should have three quantum numbers. So it depends on r and the two angles, theta and phi. And so it's this R and L function times Y L M of theta and phi. And so what is it? It's the one over R, R over A to the L plus one, E to the minus R over A, right? All this stuff. And then there's this Laguerre polynomial. And all that depends on radius, but we have this spherical harmonic that shows how the wave function depends on orientation. Okay, and this has three quantum numbers, n, 
L and M. Okay, so now um, let's think about, you know, what are the allowed values there? Well, I told you that the um, Laguerre polynomial has a certain degree, right? That the polynomial degree is n minus l minus one. And that is, um, well, for any polynomial, the degree is greater than or equal to zero. So that uh, tells us then that n is greater than or equal to l plus one. Or if you wanna turn it around and make it an inequality on l, you could say l is less than or equal to n minus one. That's the way people usually say it. Um, though, of course, it means the same thing. Okay, so because of that, we would say um, n has to be an integer greater than or equal to one. And L is an integer from zero to L minus, not L minus one, excuse me, N minus one. And M is an integer as we discussed before with the spherical harmonics from negative L to L. Okay, so, you know, we can pick any value of N, integer greater than or equal to one, and then there's a certain range of allowed values of L, and for that L, there's a certain range of allowed values for M. Um, okay, and then there's a corresponding energy, right? As there always is in the solution of a quantum mechanics problem. And so the corresponding energy, oops, the energy is um, an E sub N, which is minus mass of the electron over two h bar squared, and then this e squared over four pi epsilon naught, all of that squared, and times one over n squared. So um, you'll, you'll notice that it depends only on n. And it does not depend on L or M. Um, in general, for a problem in spherical coordinates, um, it can't depend on M. Right? So indeed for the particle in a sphere, it did not depend on M. For a particle in a sphere though, it did depend on L. And so um, it, is, it is a, a funny thing about the hydrogen atom that it does not depend on L. It only depends on N. There is actually some deep reason based on symmetry that I can't really go into, but it's a it's a special feature of the um, one over R potential, the Coulomb potential uh, for the hydrogen atom. Um, okay, so then, um, so this, what I can point out is that um, this is a, constant energy right there. And this energy gets a name. It is called the Rydberg energy. Um, R sub E, I guess, which is 
uh, 13.6 uh, electron volts. So the energy of one of these states for the hydrogen atom is negative, this Rydberg energy over n squared. So it is a negative energy. It's a negative energy relative to having an electron at infinity. Um, so, you know, the, the zero of energy is when the electron is infinitely far from the proton, right? That's what the assumption that went into defining the potential energy. So when R goes to infinity, the potential energy goes to zero, right? So that's, that's our zero of energies when the electron and proton are infinitely far apart. And so um, here, any of these states that we have calculated um, have a negative energy relative to infinity, meaning that they are bound states like the bound state that we found for the particle in a delta function potential, right? That there are states where the electron is bound to be close to the proton in the atom. Um, and so the energy is less than if the electron were infinitely far away. Okay, so there, um, there are a few things I'd like to tell you both now about the wave functions and about the, um, the uh, energies. Um, how about the wave functions first? Okay, let me show you some Mathematica code I made for that. So if I stop the iPad and I share the Mathematica, Okay, so here is some um, mathematical code um, for calculating the wave functions. Okay, and um, I managed to get it a little bit faster than my code two days ago, um, so I can evaluate it live at least, but I still can't make a movie, unfortunately. Um, okay, so he, here in this code, I start by inputting the numbers for n. L and M. Okay, so then here is the equation for the wave function. Okay. So the dependence on theta and phi is this spherical harmonic. Okay, that's what you already know about. Then what else is here? There is the uh, associated Laguerre polynomial. Mathematica knows about those things, luckily. All right. So here is that polynomial. And then there's the factor of R over A to the Lth power. There is the exponential factor of E to the minus R over NA. And um, the textbook actually provides an exact expression for the normalization constant. So I just copied this thing out of the textbook. Okay, so here is uh, with specific values of n, l, and m. Here's the wave function, okay? Here's the wave function for n equals one, l equals zero, m equals zero. Okay. This is just a constant times the exponential of minus r over a. Okay. Is this normalized? Let's check. Oh, good. It works. Okay. So this is the integral with the correct measure of integration, the r squared sine theta, uh, the conjugate of psi times psi. And I'm integrating that for r goes from zero to infinity, theta goes from zero to pi, and phi goes from zero to two pi. Right? That comes out to be one. 
right? And the, it, the energy is supposed to be this thing, right? So it's negative. Here's the Rydberg. Here's the one over n squared. Okay, so now um, let's check and see if this thing, which is supposed to be a solution, really satisfies the time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, so I'm going to calculate negative h bar squared over two mass times the Laplacian of psi in spherical coordinates. So Mathematica knows about spherical coordinates. And then minus this Coulomb potential times psi, or excuse me, I mean, plus the negative Coulomb potential times psi. And I want to compare that with the energy times psi. Does that really come out to be zero? Yes, it does. All right. And in order to make this comparison, I have to plug in you know, what is A, right? This is the equation I told you for A, for the, the Bohr radius. Okay. So now, if I want to plot this thing, uh, I can change it from um, Cartesian, from, from spherical to Cartesian coordinates. And I'll put in the unit of length that a goes to one. Okay, so that makes this expression to plot in Cartesian coordinates. And I can plot the real part or the imaginary part, which is zero in this case, or the probability density. Uh, okay, so here's my nice little contour plot for the uh, real part. It is spherically symmetric, right? That goes along with having L equals zero and M equals zero. That is a spherically symmetric function. The imaginary part, there's nothing to plot. It's a real, okay? So the probability is the real part squared. It's a spherically symmetric function. Okay, so that is the lowest energy state. The n equals one, l equals zero, m equals zero. Okay, what about another state? Okay, let's try n equals two and still maybe spherically symmetric. So l equals zero, m equals zero. So I can tell Mathematica to evaluate the whole notebook and we can see, yep, it is normalized. Oh, good. It satisfies Schrodinger's equation. And the plot, well, it's, it's coming. It takes a few seconds. Come on, come on, come on. So here there's a sphere. And maybe you can remember, this is bigger than the last sphere was. Right. The, the last sphere was a little here, it's bigger. So the n equals two state has the electron on average farther from the proton. Okay. That makes a higher energy. Okay. And the probability density looks, looks the same. All right. What if we didn't have L equals zero? What if we had L equals one? and m equals zero. Okay, let's evaluate all that. And we can check it all again. So yes, normalized, yes, satisfies Schrodinger, uh, and come out with the plot. Okay, now you can see that the plot has these two lobes, okay? So there's a, a lobe that's where the wave function is negative real, and there's a lobe where the wave function is positive real. It's never imaginary. And then the probability density, that's the absolute value squared of the wave function. It looks like this, okay? So in this particular state, the electron is likely to be 
either above or below the proton along the z-axis, but it's not going to be right in the plane of z equals zero. Uh, let's keep going, okay? So let's try uh, L equals one, M equals one. I'll evaluate all of that and um, it still is normalized. It still satisfies Schrodinger. And let's see the wave functions. Come on, come on, come on. Here it is. Okay. So it has these two lobes uh, in the real part of psi. So now they're along the x axis instead of being along the z axis. Okay. And for the imaginary part, they're along the y axis. So when I take the real part and imaginary part squared, I get this kind of a shape. It's sort of like a, a donut, right? For where there's the most probability of finding the electron. It's most likely to be in the xy plane, some certain distance out from the proton. Okay. Um, let's do a few more. I'm not tired of it yet. Okay, so let's let's do a few more. Let's go up to n equals three, and go back to maybe l equals zero, n equals zero. Okay. So if I evaluate that, let's see. Still satisfies normalization. Still satisfies Schrodinger, and uh, for the plots, um, well, we expect it should be spherically symmetric, right? Because it has L equals zero. Better be spherically symmetric. Let's see how it comes out. Um, well, I know my software could evaluate this when I was preparing. <laughs> but now I'm running Zoom also, so it takes a little longer. Okay, so here it's, uh, it's a sphere again, and it's a bigger sphere. Um, and the probability, well, and the probability is also going to be a bigger sphere, right? So there's nothing imaginary, and the probability is going to be a bigger sphere. Um, okay. Um, that is for... L equals zero. Um, let's let's make a big jump. How about L equals two? Let's see what that's going to look like now. So if we have L equals two and M equals zero, let's see about you. So uh, still normalized, still satisfies Schrodinger. Okay, let's see what it looks like. Um, maybe I should have done these things in advance instead of just doing them on the fly. Um, okay, here's an interesting looking wave function. It has negative lobes along the z-axis, and here's a positive lobe that's kind of this donut shape around the... Um, around the, in the xy plane okay and it's it's real right there's no imaginary part and so the probability density looks like this right that there's probability there's a big probability to have the electron in any of those places but very low probability to have the electron off at the places angles in between right? so there are nodes in between Right, where there's no probability of having the electron. And this goes along with going up to a higher value of L, right? That the higher the quantum numbers are, the more nodes there are, the more rapidly the wave function varies as a function of anything, of R or theta or phi. And then if we go to M equals one, maybe. 
All right, let's do this. Uh, okay, and my checks still work for the normalization in the Schrodinger equation. Um, so that's m equals one. And here now, the real part of the wave function has these lobes, right? The positive lobes and negative lobes in the xz plane. And the imaginary part also has these four lobes, but now in the yz plane. And then, come on, the probability should be coming any minute now. Um, and so it looks like it has these uh, two donuts, right, at certain um, values of z above and below the proton. And I'll do just one more of these things before I give up. Let's try m equals two. And to evaluate all of that. All right, that should be coming. So if you compare these results with what we had a couple of days ago for the particle in a sphere, right, you can see that the angular dependence is just like what we had then, because it's the same function of angle. So the only thing that's different now compared to the particle in a sphere is the radial dependence, right? How the wave function depends on the distance out from the origin. And so that is getting rescaled farther out. Right? So for the particle in a sphere, there's a hard cutoff. There's the wall of the sphere. The electron can't be any farther out than that. In this case, it's softer. It's an exponential decay as a function of distance instead of the hard cutoff. Okay, but you see the wave function um, now has, the, again, this, this four lobe structure uh, for the real part and the imaginary part. And now the probability density comes out looking like this um, donut. Um, so, so I will post this Mathematica file on the Google Drive, and any of you who have Mathematica can download and practice with it and try putting in different numbers. Okay, but I will tell you what I was um, shocked to discover this morning. Okay, um, so, so, you know, I wrote all this code for you guys. Huh, I worked so hard writing all this code for you guys. And then I discovered that um, there's an app for that. Um, and so let's see what I can show you. Okay, so if I look on my iPad and I look in the app store, um, whoops, it's not there anymore. If we say at um, in a box, Adam in a box. Look, somebody already made an app to calculate all this stuff. Okay. And um, it costs $5. So I spent the $5 so you don't have to. And so let's see what this app does. Okay. So here, look at this app. Oh no, it's, it's tilted. How do I make it not be tilted? Well, all right. It doesn't really matter which side of the hydrogen atom is up. It's just that there's a cat which is tilted and you have to turn your head like this to look at it. Okay. So um, you can see, you recognize, first of all, there's a cat, right? You see a cat that says one, zero, zero, right? You see that thing, right? Okay. And so um, that's this cat notation, right? So that's our notation for the wave function. So here, this guy who wrote the app made uh, a cat that has the quantum numbers n comma l comma m, right? And then um, if you click on this i button in the corner, 
it has more information, which you have to turn on your side to see. Okay. And what's going wrong with my stupid screen? Okay. Well, anyway, so what are the things that it shows you? You can see it shows you Schrodinger's equation. Okay. And so um, it is solving Schrodinger's equation here. Do you see my mouse pointing to things? Yeah, okay. So it's solving Schrodinger's equation here, okay? The uh, negative h bar squared over two, um, mu is for mass. And then this delta is for Laplacian. That's the notation for Laplacian that some people use, okay? Uh, of psi as a function of position and time, minus the potential energy. So this is, some other notation for the Coulomb potential, but it's a e squared over r kind of potential times psi is equal to i h bar d psi dt. So that's the time dependent Schrodinger equation that you know about. Okay. And then it's telling you what's the energy of the state. E sub n is this. Rydberg energy, the negative 13.6 electron volts uh, divided by n squared, and n equals one. Um, so here is a regular plot of the um, radial part of the wave function, okay? So this is the wave function and how it depends on r. So you can see it goes up and then it goes down again, okay? Um, and then here's the equation for the wave function, the whole wave function as a function of R, theta, and phi. Um, all right, and then when you look at the picture, um, wh what are we looking at here? Okay, well, this is, um, a slice through the wave function in some plane, okay? So the plane of the screen, I don't know if it's the XY plane or the XZ plane, or maybe it's just some funny diagonal plane, but whatever it is, it's some plane, okay? And the intensity of light is telling you about the magnitude of the wave function, and the color is telling you about the phase of the wave function. That is, for a complex number, you could say it has a real part and an imaginary part, or you could say it has a magnitude and a phase. And so they're interpreting it as a magnitude and a phase, and so the brightness is the magnitude and the color is the phase. And for the time, independent, no, excuse me, the time dependent Schrodinger equation, the, um, the phase is changing. It's changing with time as with this time dependent exponential factor, right? The e to the minus i times energy times time divided by h bar. Okay, so the phase keeps changing in time. And so that's the the variation in color that you see. Okay, so now suppose we want to change which state we're looking at. Okay, so I can click on my cat and click the plus. Okay, so now it goes to the 200 zero, zero state, right? And you can see in the 200 zero, zero state, um, there is a region of high probability close to the proton. And then there's a node as a function of R around here. And then there's another region of high probability out there. And all of this is changing in time. And it's changing in time. Um, yeah, well, okay, so all, all this is changing in time also. Okay, and... Um, this is a wave function which is spherically symmetric, but you can't see the spherical symmetry because this is just a slice through the origin and in some plane, I don't know which one. 
Okay, so that's n equals two, l equals zero, m equals zero. All right, now here is l equals one. All right, and so you can see it has this two lobe structure and the structure is changing periodically in this plane um, as uh, a function of time. Okay. And then this is L equals one, M equals zero. Here is M equals one. Right. And then we could go up to L equals three and well, it looks more complicated as you saw with my 3D visualization. And here it's L equals one, M equals one. Here's L equals two, um, M equals one, then L equals two, M equals two. Okay, and we can keep going up. How high does this thing go? Eight, nine, 10? Wow, it just keeps going up. Amazing. Okay. And so when um, L equals 10, no, when N equals 10, you see a lot of nodes as far as radius goes. And then if I go to a big value of L, there are a lot of nodes as far as data goes. Right, as in terms of the angle. Okay, and so um, we get something that's shifting periodically in, uh, in this way. Okay, so this is an app that I just discovered this morning. And, um, you know, what can I say? I work my butt off for you guys, and then I discover I can be replaced by an app that costs $5. So, man, what can you do? How many years do I have left before retirement? I guess. Um, so um, that's life. All right. So that, whoops, stop, stop. Okay. That is what I wanted to show you about the wave functions. Okay. So now, what about the energies? Okay. So I have a little bit more time to talk about energies. Okay. We, we, we have this um, set of uh, energies, all right? And so um, for uh, some, some examples here, okay. for the examples, the, the lowest energy state, which is what we call the ground state, so that has n equals one, l equals zero, m equals zero. So the energy for that state, that's negative one Rydberg energy. So negative 13.6 electron volts. And the wave function for that, which I already showed you in Mathematica, and in that guy's app is um, psi sub one zero zero. Okay, that's not one hundred, right? It's one comma zero comma zero, and that is this function of one over the square root of pi a cubed e to the minus r over a. Right? And this thing is uh, spherically symmetric um, meaning that it is independent of um, theta and phi okay and um, then what, right? Well, then we can go to what's the next lowest, okay? So that is an excited state. 
that is with n equals two. So E2 is negative 13.6 electron volts uh, divided by two squared. So that's negative uh, 3.4 electron volts. Okay, so it's quite a bit higher in energy compared to n equals one. Okay. And it, so it's closer to having the electron at infinity. Okay. And then with what goes along with n equals two is we can have L equals zero and then M equals zero. Okay, so that the wave function is psi two zero zero, which is some constant over A times one minus R over two A times E to the minus R over two A times this Y zero zero of theta and phi, which is a constant. So this thing is spherically symmetric. Or we can have um, L equals one and M equals minus one or zero or plus one. And then the state would be psi sub two one M of R theta and phi, which is some uh, constant over four a squared r e to the minus r over two a times y one m of theta and phi. And this does have an angular dependence as I was just showing you with both kinds of visualizations. So those are examples with n equals one and n equals two. Now we could have n equals three or four or five or 500. We could ask what if n goes to infinity, right? What if we have a really high quantum number n? In that case, the energy En, that's the negative uh, Rydberg energy over N squared. All right, well, if you're dividing by infinity squared, that goes to zero. Okay. Zero means the energy when the electron is infinitely far from the proton. Okay. So when you go to a very high quantum number n, the electron can get arbitrarily far from the proton. That is, the electron is you know, hardly bound to the proton at all. The word for that in chemistry is ionization. Okay. So chemists would say the hydrogen atom becomes ionized when it loses its electron. That is, the electron doesn't disappear, but it can get extremely far away from the proton. So you're left with just a plain proton, which is a hydrogen plus ion, and an electron somewhere else. 
maybe it could get attached to a different atom somewhere. So that is the phenomenon of ionization. And in the language of, um, of uh, bound states and scattering states that we've been talking about, we would say the um, electron leaves the bound state, uh, leaves a bound state, and it goes into a scattering state. Um, so a scattering state is a state where the electron you know, is not bound to the proton, but it can be somewhere else. And then the energy can be even higher than that. So we could say for an energy E greater than zero, we have a scattering state. So that is that the um, electron, uh, the electron can have you know, an, a potential energy that is as high as zero, and then it might have kinetic energy also when it's far from the proton. And then it would have a total energy that's greater than zero. Um, and you remember, we talked about the, the form of the potential, right? The form of the potential uh, v, v of R versus R, you know, it looks like this, right? Or we could say, if it's as a function of X, or it gets a function of X, it looks like this, right? And um, what you can notice about this is that the potential energy becomes flat when the electron is very far from the proton. So this is like the golf course potential that um, I told you about back when we were doing one dimension, right? That it's a potential energy that is flat and then it has a hole somewhere, okay? So the proton makes the hole, okay? But far from the proton, it's flat. And so this is a potential energy like the golf course, which can have both bound states and scattering states. Okay? And so the bound states are the psi NLM and the scattering states, well, we're not really gonna talk about them in this semester, but um, the scattering states are other states where the electron can be far from the proton and it's moving you know, approximately as a complex exponential or a sum of a few complex exponentials. Um, and so there is some energy to take the electron far from the proton. And that is called the ionization energy. Okay, so that is E at infinity minus E in the lowest energy state. Okay, so um, this is um, zero, that's the energy at infinity, minus negative 13.6 electron volts. So that is positive 13.6 electron volts. Okay, so that's the energy required to uh, move the uh, electron far from the proton. Okay. How am I doing? Oh, I don't really have time, do I? No, okay. Um, I will stop here, I guess, okay? So here are some things about the, um, the hydrogen atom and 
I will do a little bit more with the hydrogen atom on Monday and then go on to a new subject. And uh, I will have a new homework for you guys on Monday. But in the meantime, the current homework is due today. So please send it to me if you have not done so already. All right, good. Um, let's, uh, let's stop here and I will see you guys on Monday then. Thanks.